Hello everyone, welcome to today's research seminar brought to you by the Department of English and Communication at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Today's speaker is Professor Pavana, Pavana Tavakole, who is based in Reading University in the UK. Her main research interests lie in the interface of language acquisition, language teaching and language testing. Across her career, she has led several international projects exploring language performance, acquisition, assessment and policy. She has published in prestigious, prestigious journals like the Journal of Modern Language Review and with prestigious um, publishers like Cambridge University Press. Uh, she will soon publish a forthcoming monograph uh, entitled Comprehensibility in Language Testing. Um, so without further ado, I hand over to Professor Pavana Savakole. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. Um, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone who's joined us in this talk uh, from uh, wherever in this global village uh, you are at the moment. Um, it is absolute pleasure and honor to be able to present at this seminar series. I am specifically grateful uh, to Dr. Jamie McKeon and the Department of English and Communication at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, what I'm going to do today is to present summaries of uh, three research projects I have been recently involved in. But before uh, going to the details of the projects, I would provide a, a background to um, the research. Uh, my background starts by um, um, expressing my personal interest in the topic of fluency, and then by highlighting the importance of fluency from an academic, th theoretical, and professional perspective. So um, I come, oh, okay, I come from a language teaching perspective, probably like many of you in this room, and um, my students, interest and uh, for many of them their main objective in language learning was to become fluent speakers to be communicatively uh, successful in their second language learning. Uh, at the end of the process of language learning many of them also hoped to get a kind of language certification for their proficiency. Um, at the time, I'm talking about 1990s, uh, TOEFL was a very popular test in my context. I guess it is still a very popular test around the world. And I could see that um, the different tasks of the test, speaking test, uh, had different kinds of um, influences on uh, what the um, test takers did how they perform the task, and eventually the scores that they achieved. I'm just giving you an example of a picture story based task that was very common to use by a range of uh, language testing organizations back in the 1990s and TOEFL had a, a oral an oral narrative task. So my interest was based, my professional interest came from that background. Uh, but And through that experience, I also became familiar with the assessment of speaking, how speaking is being assessed by these language testing organizations. And then through the coming years and decades, I um, when I started my PhD, I specifically looked into these areas and had an interest in how fluency is being assessed. More than two decades on, I can still see that um, the same tests, well, I can say tests have changed to some extent, but in principle, they are doing more or less what they were doing back then. So there are, in many tests of uh, English language proficiency, there are still picture stories, visual aids that are uh, supposed to help elicit performance 
um, spoken performance that can be assessed. And I can say that I am still interested in those areas of research, but now I'm more aware of what uh, my colleague Alana Shohami calls the power of tests, the power of language tests. Um, we all probably know very well that uh, language tests and language testing organizations act as powerful gatekeepers at transitional moments of the test taker's life, whether these moments are employment, education, or immigration related. Therefore, it is necessary from a research perspective to investigate that kind of power and to see to what extent that power relies on reliable and valid measurement of spoken spoken language ability. So moving on, I would also like to add uh, my professional and the theoretical interest in uh, investigating fluency. Um, like two decades ago, fluency is still playing a very important role in communicative success. This role has probably become more salient, more dominant, because the world of today relies on communication and communication seems to be more important with issues around mobility and globalization. From a second language acquisition perspective, fluency is still a core construct in speech production. This is a topic that I would go back to in a, in a few minutes. But what has changed in 2020, 30, uh, 23 that has put fluency even in a more salient and significant position is the development of technological advancements. Now, all language testing organizations are looking towards the future of language testing in which automated assessment of language ability would play a more significant role. They are all looking at AI-oriented approaches to assessing language ability. And against that backdrop, fluency seems to be uh, an important area, an area that lends itself well to the assessment, um, uh, AI-oriented and automated assessment of second language ability. So there are some key questions to answer with regard to fluency, including how we understand it, how we define it, how it is assessed, and whether it progresses in a linear manner with proficiency. Can fluency be used in predicting proficiency? And in what ways it is an independent construct or dependent on other aspects of communication. Obviously, in this talk, I won't be able to discuss all these matters, but I hope that I can provide some answers to the first couple of questions and a look at the third one. So, Moving to the theoretical background, um, I would like to start by highlighting the role of fluency in speech production models first. If we look at Label's model of speech production, which is a widely cited and frequently used model, Label proposes that speech in first language is produced through three stages of conceptualizer, formulator, an articulator, an ongoing process of monitoring a company's speech production at all these stages. At the conceptualizer, a pre-verbal message is generated through micro planning and make uh, macro planning and micro planning, where information is selected, sequenced, and put into focus and perspective. Then this pre-verbal message moves to the formulator through um, lexicon 
activation, lemma retrieval, grammatical encoding, and phonological encoding, the verbal message, the language message is generated. Then this moves to the articulator and through changing it to overt speech, language will be produced. So in a nutshell, we can say that the three stages work in an incremental manner. The processing happens in a parallel fashion while the message is being conceptualized for the next idea, the previous idea is being uh, put into formulator and articulator. And then there is a kind of automatic processing, given that the L1 speakers have a complete set of linguistic knowledge and automatic access to that knowledge. It allows speakers to use the processes in parallel. And being parallel and being automatic gives the L1 speakers the sense of fluency. When we move to second language speech production, and my colleague Judith Cormus suggests that there are the three stages in place again. Monitoring is a lot more active for second language speech, and certain areas of processing seems to be more demanding for the speakers. Lemma activation, lexical retrieval, producing words, grammatical encoding. For that reason, she suggests that, yes, the process is incremental, but it may not be parallel or automatic, especially at lower levels of proficiency. So where does fluency stand for second language speakers? Because the processes do not happen in a parallel fashion, we can see uh, disruptions because the language is not still automatically processed, we can see disruptions. And she suggests that greater fluency is achieved when the, uh, the repertoire of linguistic knowledge becomes more complete and when the access to that knowledge and processing of that knowledge is more automatic. So we can see that fluency plays an important role in language production in general, but it is key in second language uh, speech production because it allows us to look into the speech production processes from a research perspective, fluency is perceived as an important element of speech production. But what is fluency? Um, research in fluency has proliferated um, over the past couple of decades and major developments have happened that allow us to understand it better. One major development was Lenin 1990 that suggested fluency should be perceived in terms of broad or narrow senses. From a broad sense, people define fluency, scholars define fluency in terms of <clears throat> the overall proficiency of a speaker. And in terms of narrow fluency, we talk about the specific characteristics of a speech, usually acoustic and temporal, that allow us to see how fluid and how fluent a speaker speaks. So to provide a, a brief definition for fluency, we can consider it as the general ease, flow, and continuity of a speech that is highlighted by specific temporal and acoustic features and by disfluency markers, interruptions, repetitions. <clears throat> we already talked about the central role that fluency plays. And I have just put this here in a kind of bullet point to remind you of the importance it has. 
One major development, another major development in this field has been Segalowitz's triadic model of fluency. In his model, Segalowitz suggests that fluency should be understood in three different but interrelated dimensions. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, the three dimensions are cognitive utterance and perceived fluency. Cognitive fluency refers to the efficiency of the underlying processes, the operations that allow, uh, allows speakers to produce speech, including processing skills, cognitive load, and individual differences. Utterance fluency refers to the object, observable measures of speech. For example, how fast someone speaks, how much pausing or how much hesitation can be seen. And perceived fluency refers to the impact that the ease of operations and the objective aspects of a speech have on the listener's perceptions. And you know, language testing organizations typically use ratings of fluency or perceive fluency to discuss how fluent the speaker is. <clears throat> um, another development in this field has been the three-factor model proposed by researchers, um, initially Peter Skian in 2003, and then um, Peter Skian and I in a study looking at 300 uh, performances, speech samples, we tr we used factor analysis to see in what dimensions we can perceive utterance fluency loading. Uh, as a result of this factor analysis, three distinct factors emerged underlying the utterance fluency. These are speed, silence, and repair measures of fluency. Uh, since then, since 2005, several other studies have looked into um, where utterance fluency uh, puts its weight on. And for example, a study by my, by my colleagues, um, um, Shungo, Shungo Suzuki and Judith Cormus, suggest that this is the three-factor model. What we know about fluency, um, to provide you with a summary, we know that it is multidimensional, different dimensions uh, are in play and they interact with one another. We also know that fluency is a complex construct because of these different dimensions interacting with one another, we often find it difficult to define fluency and to operationalize it. We also know that fluency is at least to some extent a characteristic of the speaker's personal style. Some people, for example, speak faster than others. Some people pause a lot and some people might have a lot more hesitations in their speech. We also know that first language plays a role in fluency. So for example, uh, certain language backgrounds speak faster than others. Typically Japanese and Spanish speakers are um, considered as fast speakers. Uh, also, we know that cultural issues might have an impact on fluency. So for example, if we consider English which is a lingua franca, and we look into the fluency behavior of speakers across different contexts and different variations of English language, we identify uh, differences among their use of um, pauses, among the use of their repair measures. And we also know that the pausing patterns are different when it comes to speech to speaking. L1 speakers typically pause at the end of a clause, whereas L2 speakers pause a lot in the middle of the clause. 
Okay. With all this background, I would like to start discussing the research studies that I have done in uh, the past uh, few years. The first study uh, that I'm going to report here, I have conducted the study with my colleagues, Dr. Fumi Nakatsuharo and Dr. Anne-Marie Hunter. And we, cho we chose this topic because of our interest in language testing. So we looked into the assessment of fluency in the aptis test of English. Um, if you look at assessment of fluency across different language tests, you would see similar patterns. Language tests of a different range they all assess fluency. Some of them assess fluency independent of the other subconstructs. Others merge fluency with some uh, other subconstructs. For example, in IELTS, fluency and coherence appear in the same um, subconstruct. In Trinity, fluency appears under delivery. And in TOEFL IBT, it is again merged with delivery. But some other organizations, for example, Pearson Test of English and Aptis, they assess fluency as an independent subconstruct of the speaking ability. There are also some other synergies uh, in the assessment of um, fluency. Uh, most of these organizations consider fluency in terms of pausing, in terms of interruptions, and in terms of speed and pace. Most often, these organizations rely almost heavily on issues related to disruptions, for example, repetitions, hesitations, and issues related to flow. So what does research in this area tells us? We know based on the research that aspects of fluency are reliable predictors of oral proficiency and different studies suggest different aspects can tell us how proficient the speaker is, at least to some extent. So speed, number of field pauses and um, mean length of run have been suggested as measures that can predict proficiency. We also know that fluency is task dependent. The task design affects fluency. So for example, if the task is monologic, speakers typically speak slower than when they're engaged in a dialogic speech. These were the two research questions for the Aptis study. We were basically interested in finding out to what extent our objective measures of utterance fluency relate to the rater's subjective measures or assessment of fluency. For those of you who are not familiar with the APTIS, this is a relatively newly developed test by the British Council, um, Barry O'Sullivan and Jamie Dunley have um, conducted it. It is um, based on the CFR document and it assesses test takers from A2 to C1. There are four tasks in uh, the test and the test is delivered to computer. So basically this test takers are expected to respond to questions and their responses are recorded um, on a computer. Uh, the assessment is holistic and task specific. So for each task, a set of marking um, rating descriptors and rating scales are considered. So very briefly, if we look at the rating descriptors and rating scales for fluency, we can see several examples of frequent pausing, false starts, reformulations, but meaning is 
clear. And this pattern is repeated. So as I said before, the assessment heavily relies on repair measures as well as pausing. At higher levels, we can also find references to other aspects of speech, other aspects, including communicative um, aspects of um, how people interact with each other, backtracking, reformulations, but not interruptions. We had 32 test takers performances in four tasks. Uh, that was 128 samples of speech. We used PRAT, which is um, one of the technological advancements in this area. PRAT is a software developed by Borisma and Wienig that allows um, researchers to have some accurate and objective uh, objective and reliable measures of fluency. This allows us to uh, assess the temporal and acoustic features of speech with high degrees of precision. The measures that we used uh, were very uh, different. Um, a wide range of measures were used, speed, composite, and silence. These were measured using PRAT uh, for repair measures, uh, human coding and double coding was in place. We used a range of statistical analysis and we identified some uh, statistically significant differences. But a word of warning is that this is a small sample size and we had a large number of multiple comparisons we would like the results to be interpreted with caution. We found a number of statistically significant differences between different levels, which was good news, suggesting that uh, the ratings, uh, the raters have produced, um, distinguished between these uh, different levels in terms of uh, their proficiency, their fluency measures. But looking more carefully into um, the differences across the different levels, we identified some patterns. And I, for reasons of time, I just give you a snapshot of these patterns. We found that speed-related measures were good at distinguishing different levels of proficiency a1, um, A2 from B1 and B1 from B2. These measures were different, um, uh, these levels were different in terms of their speed. However, B2 and C1 levels were not statistically different, although we can see slight difference or increase in the speed with the C1 level. So speed was a characteristic of speech at these different levels, although there was a ceiling effect. People improved their proficiency, improved their speed, but then there is so much you can increase your speed about. In terms of pauses, we also found that long pauses were a characteristic of the lower proficiency groups. As people improve their uh, proficiency, the length of pauses become shorter and therefore it wasn't possible to distinguish between the higher levels of proficiency in terms of pausing. So, so far we had some good news. What was very surprising was that repair measures did not show us any linear progression across proficiency levels. It didn't show us any clear patterns across tasks. And the results of the repair measures suggested that a complex and more complex process was 
in play. Anyway, the results suggest that repair fluency does not distinguish proficiency levels. So as a way of summarizing, we can say that length of pause and speed are measures that language testing organizations can use in assessment of fluency if we're going towards uh, an automated assessment uh, model of proficiency. There was a ceiling effect that is important to note, and most strikingly, um, the lack of distinction from repair measures. This study has had implications for aptest to consider a need to validate the rating scales, a need to change the rating training materials, rated training materials. And I need to say that this study was limited in terms of sample size, and it was perhaps different from what the research had suggested before because it was a computer mediated, computer delivered uh, test. The findings of the study are published in the Modern Language Journal. And um, if you are more, if you're interested in learning more about um, language testing and issues related to fluency, I suggest you have a look at this book that my colleague Claire Wright and I have published with Cambridge University Press. The findings of the Aptus study gave us impetus to go on and look into other tests. If Aptus test fails to distinguish um, speakers in terms of different aspects of fluency, we need to know whether this applies to other um, measures of um, other tests of um, English, international tests of English. So we, we started to design a project that could look into whether the findings of the Aptis study can be replicated in other tests. So with my colleagues at the University of Reading, we started looking into our own test of English for educational purposes. Some of you might already be familiar with uh, the TEEP test. And um, this is a test that was uh, designed back in the 1980s by Professor Cyril Weir at the University of Reading. It has been developed, enhanced, and validated since then, and it is still used by not only the University of Reading, but other universities in the UK and a couple of universities elsewhere in the world. It is very similar to um, IELTS in terms of uh, levels. It moves from A1 to C2 across nine levels. So we decided to focus on the monologic task for replication purposes. As the aptest tasks were all monologic, we chose the monologic performance of this test and we aimed to investigate whether the findings of Tavakoli et al. could be replicated. Here we had a larger sample size. We had different participants and a slightly different construct because here the test takers are taking the test for academic purposes and it's a, it's a kind of EAP test, which is different from Aptis General. And we had different task conditions because this test um, is delivered face to face um, and the test takers are given uh, three minutes planning time before they start um, performing the task. So again, we were keen to see whether uh, objective measures of utterance fluency uh, were relatable to the ratings of proficiency done by TEEP raters. We used the same measures and we used very similar um, 
procedures for analyzing the data. We had 60 test takers, 15 at each proficiency level. And the results suggested some significant differences for speed and for pausing. So again, for reasons of time, I just provide a summary of the findings. Very similar to the APTIS study, we found that speed was a good measure to distinguish different levels of proficiency, but a ceiling effect was here in place too. Breakdown fluency, again, pauses were a good measure to distinguish lower level proficiency speakers from higher level. And the same for frequency, for um, length of pauses. And surprisingly, repair fluency. Again, we didn't find any significant results. And this suggested that repair fluency fails to distinguish speakers across any proficiency levels. The results are published in language testing uh, this year. And this brings me to the conclusions from the language testing studies. Okay, if we put the findings of the two studies together, the overall findings suggest that some measures of utterance fluency are successful in distinguishing test takers across proficiency levels. These measures are speed fluency and silent pauses. For speed fluency, we must be aware that there is only so much that people can become faster. What did these findings imply? In what ways can they have an impact on what we do? Uh, obviously, and basically, the findings have significant implications for the two tests, APTIS and TEEP. And I can say that the two organizations have already started working on their either rated training materials or their rating scales. In the case of TEEP, they're working on both um, aspects, in fact. So we can use the objective measures of utterance fluency to improve the existing practice in language testing organizations. Definitely change is needed with regard to repair measures. And this is something that language testing organizations have relied on very much over the past. But perhaps a more important impact of this research is that it suggests utterance fluency measures can be used in automated assessment of speaking. We can now have a concrete evidence that fluency is one of the areas that lends itself well to this area of assessment. Now I want to move to the final study, which is um, a language teaching related study. As said earlier in this talk, I come from a language teaching perspective and I am very keen about what teachers do and what they think and feel about what they do. So the purpose of this study was to investigate how teachers perceive and define fluency and how they use their knowledge and skills to promote fluency. From a language teaching perspective, fluency is now um, articulated in language uh, benchmarks and language curricula. I have here provided uh, two examples one of a national language curriculum and one of an international language benchmark, both of which suggest that fluency is uh, an important goal, an important objective for these curricula. 
So uh, the recent development in the Department for Education in the United Kingdom and the development of the modern foreign language GCSE subject content clearly makes references to um, fluency. And the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, especially in its further developments in the companion volume, suggest that fluency is central to language learning and language assessment. If we take um, the common European um, CFR document and run a very initial analysis, we can see that fluency is one of the five subcomponents of a speaking ability. And it is defined in clear terms and it is a part of the can-do statements. But if we look at this from a language teacher perspective, especially given all the tasks, the huge tasks that language teachers have to deal with, we can see that some of the language used is quite vague and confusing. So language is produced spontaneously, fluently and effortlessly, at length with a natural colloquial flow, and produce stretches of language with an even tempo. Such language is almost invariably open to personal interpretation, and the complexities involved in the use of that kind of language makes it clear that it, it will be a difficult topic to be understood by teachers in similar ways. Moving from the CFR documents on, um, I want to provide some background to this study. This study was based on a series of CPD workshops in the UK. In these workshops, my colleagues and I were presenting the findings of our research from an instructional perspective to a range of teachers. The aims of this, uh, the uh, workshops were to understand teachers' perceptions of fluent speech, to understand their readiness to promote fluency, and to see the extent to which providing them with one day workshop can help them develop their perceptions and skills. There were 80 teachers uh, involved from different language teaching backgrounds. The workshops took place in the UK and uh, the teachers had a range of different educational professional qualifications and background. The data that I'm reporting here comes from 166 questionnaires, some Likert scaled items and some open-ended questions, then follow-up interviews and follow-up online surveys that took place 10 to 12 weeks after the workshops. So we had pre-workshop questionnaires, immediately post-workshop questionnaires, and delayed questionnaires in 12 weeks plus interviews. This is a sample of some of the um, Likert scaled questions that the teachers received before and after the workshops. And the open-ended questions were aiming for understanding teachers' understanding of fluency, how they define a fluent speaker, providing examples of activities and strategies they use to help the learners become fluent, and why fluency was important from their perspectives. We had a corpus of 
language used by the teachers in defining fluency, in highlighting its importance, and in skills um, in exercises and strategies that they used in their class. In terms of their definitions of fluency, we analyzed um, their definitions and we came up with um, four groups of definitions, how they understand and define fluency. As you can see, they provided us with a large percentage of definitions that were either aiming at general L2 proficiency or general speaking ability. And these are more or less what Lennon 1990 suggested as the broad perspective to understanding fluency. There was a smaller percentage of definitions that suggested they look at fluency from a narrow perspective. And of course, there were some vague or uninformative definitions. When we looked at the activities that they suggest they use to promote students' fluency, again, a large majority of the activities were activities aimed at promoting students' communicative free production. These were aimed at generally improving their spontaneous speech production and communication. A smaller uh, amount was aimed at general L2 proficiency and very small amounts were aimed at developing fluency in a narrow sense. So these findings suggested to us that Lennon's uh, dichotomy of uh, broad versus narrow senses of fluency may need a bit further expansion. What we observed in our data suggested that there were four levels at which teachers defined fluency. And these four levels started from the very broad level of defining fluency as the general uh, proficiency, moving to broad, which is speaking ability, and then narrow, which refers to ease or flow of speech, and very narrow is the perspective that only a few teachers use talking about specific measures of speech, such as speed and repair. We can see that the very broad and very narrow are special types of fluency with a very narrow, probably useful for um, researchers and very broad, probably useful for uh, public people without any interest in uh, language or linguistics. What we suggested was that providing a narrow perspective to teachers would probably help them improve their understanding of fluency and their practice in classroom. And that is what we did in the workshops. So during the workshops, the workshops were research informed, practice oriented and very interactive. The teachers had to work in groups on different activities that can help the learners promote their fluency. As I said before, we, we try to provide a narrow or a na very narrow perspective to understanding fluency. And then we examined teachers' knowledge later on. The results suggested positive impact of this intervention, one day workshop on teachers' understanding of fluency, on their self-reported practice of what they would do in their classrooms to promote fluency. This finding was also clearly visible at a delayed post-test stage in 12 weeks. A lot of the teachers could still uh, talk about the way they're using these new skills, new strategies in their classrooms. Our conclusion was that 
adopting a narrow perspective can help teachers in defining and conceptualizing fluency and in developing um, activities that their learners would benefit from. Again, the findings are presented in uh, an article in Language Teaching Research. So as a way of summarizing and concluding this talk, I would like to say that for future work, there are at least three areas that we need to look into. Uh, first of all, we need to have more investment in fluency research. From a language assessment perspective, we have seen how um, useful investigating fluency could be in future forms of uh, uh, assessing proficiency. Uh, it seems to me, whether we like it or not, uh, using automated scoring and using artificial intelligent, intelligence in assessment of fluency is the way to future. Therefore, it is important that we as researchers intervene in this to make sure that uh, the future forms of assessment are fair, are reliable and are valid. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to say that we need to invest more in instruction of fluency. The findings of the study that I just reported to you a few minutes ago um, was very, were very clear in suggesting that there is a scope for development, not only in teachers, but also in materials and in the curriculum. If you look into different curricula around the world, you would identify the need for paying more attention to fluency. Many curricula do not even mention the concept of fluency, whereas we know it is a central construct in communicative uh, adequacy. The second point that I would like to finish with is evaluating fluency needs. All my talk was about fluency from an academic perspective. We have talked about the importance of fluency in uh, academia for test takers who are going to join a university. What we need to do is to look into other areas of fluency. Does fluency mean the same for employment purposes? Does fluency work the same way when we ask uh, employers and recruiters? And there is emerging evidence to suggest that uh, general public and uh, employers with professional interests have a different take on fluency. What seems to us as disfluent speech may not be disfluent for these employers. And finally, we need to look at fluency from a social and cultural perspective. Um, fluency research so far has almost predominantly focused on cognitive aspects of fluency, and that is what I consider a limitation. Emerging research suggests, for example, from one of my own PhD students who is looking at the role of communicative functions of tasks on fluency, suggests that we adapt and modify our fluency behavior based on social and cultural factors. So the final word is a word of thank you to everyone who has been listening to this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Tavakole.